Good afternoon, everyone. Yes, yeah, sorry about it. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome to this week's Humanities Forum. It's a pleasure uh, to see you all here this afternoon. My name is Raymond Hain. I'm a member of the philosophy department here in the Humanities Program and the director of the Humanities Forum. The Humanities Forum exists to provide a regular space most Friday afternoons during the semester uh, where the entire campus community can come together and reflect on some of the deepest human things. We also, we do many different things, but one important thing we do is try to align ourselves with the DWC schedule. So it may be the case that some of you in the room today are thinking about 16th, 17th century Spain, Cervantes, uh, and the cultural um, developments that were happening in that time period. We also try to think about the connections between the past and our contemporary world, which is particularly important for our guests today. Please now, if you would, uh, join me in welcoming uh, my colleague, Alison Kaplan, from the Department of World Languages and Cultures, who will be introducing today's guest. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see you. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome Nick Jones to PC. Uh, Nick is uh, assistant professor of Spanish at Yale. And um, his research centers on early modern golden age Spain, 16th and 17th centuries, and the presence and literary representation of sub-Saharan African culture in Spain. And I think most of us are familiar from the courses we've taken um, we're familiar with multicultural medieval Spain, the mix of um, Christians, Muslims, and Jews, and then their legacy in the early modern period. But we're not as familiar, and because this group, the sub-Saharan African population that was present and very visible in early modern society, has really been ignored, not not well studied. And that is why we have invited uh, Nick here today, because that is the area that he has researched extensively and is writing uh, several books on this aspect of the cultural mix, the, the African, uh, sub-Saharan African population that was living in uh, early modern Spain and, have, and is represented in the literature of the time. He's the author of Staging Habla de Negros, Radical Performances of the African Diaspora in Early Modern Spain. That was published in 2019, and it, is, it, it won several first book prizes, um, one from the Association for the Study of the Worldwide African Diaspora, and another uh, as the winner of the Catherine Singer Kovacs Prize from the Modern Language Association. So it's been incredibly well received. Uh, he's working now, and his talk, his, his talk today will be taken in part from his new book, Servantine Blackness, where he explores uh, uh, Cervantes, the whole oeuvre of Cervantes, the whole obra of Cervantes, um, and the way he engages, Cervantes engages with blackness in um, early modern Spain. His earlier book, uh, Staging Habla de Negros, uh, looked at different uh, uh, theatrical works uh, and, and performance poetry. Uh, he's also the co-editor of Early Modern Black Diaspora Studies, a critical anthology, and Pornographic Sensibilities, Imagining Sex and the Visceral in Pre-Modern and Early Modern Spanish Cultural Production. He's co-editor of those two books. And he also co-edits the Rutledge Critical Junctures in Global, Urban, uh, uh, Global Early Modernities. So we're extremely honored to have you here today and look forward to your talk, Cervantes, Golden Age Spain and the 21st Century. Great. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, many thanks to um, Professor Zane and Kaplan for, and all of those working behind the scenes as well with the Humanities Forum who've invited me here and to all of you who are uh, present. So, um, and also 
in this talk, it takes three moves. So the opening really frame, not, talks about a certain section aspect of my um, new book, uh, Servantine Blackness, and delves specifically in um, contemporary issues, 21st century and such. And then the second, and I pivot a bit in the second uh, section, doing a close reading of a specific passage uh, from part one of Don Quixote de la Manza. And then the third section, in a sense, goes back to contemporary issues and it's um, perhaps a punchy critique of the state of the field, specifically my field in early modern Iberian studies. But I think that there's conversations that apply to and, and speak to you know, what's happening in Shakespeare studies, early modern English studies, early, Frank, you know, early modern France as well, um, perhaps. And so just to give you an overview of how the talk will move. So this afternoon, I will share material from my new book, Seventeen Blackness. This work comes to life in tumultuous times as I reckon with climate change, gold, global pandemics, and the invasion of and current war in the sovereign nation of Ukraine. Before the COVID-19 global pandemic, I had been living abroad in Granada, Spain, where I had finally convinced myself to dare to write a new book on the literary enterprise of Miguel de Cervantes and his handling of sub-Saharan African blackness. Living in the thick of pandemics and wars while simultaneously coping with their maddening and uncertain outcomes, social unrest and organized protest had ignited across all corners of the globe. In the words of Malcolm X on December 1st, 1963, and I quote, the chickens have come home to roost, end quote. That same year of that wintry month on December 20th, 1963, James Baldwin prophetically reiterated in his essay, A Talk to Teachers, in the Saturday Review, and I cite Baldwin here, let's begin by saying that we are living through a very dangerous time. Everyone in this room is in one way or another aware of that. We are in a revolutionary situation, no matter how unpopular that word has become in this country. The society in which we live is desperately minced from within, end quote. The genesis of Servantine Blackness originates out of a revolutionary situation. For some, quiet as it's kept, the content of this book may be too bellicose and political. For some, it may, it may embody too much controversy and too many revolutionary ideas that desperately mince or tug at the ideological sentiments of its audience. But the ideas, material, and subject matter discussed throughout this volume must come forth in order to mobilize Cervantes in relation to how readers of various constituencies relate the contemporary to the early modern period. That said, the origin story of Cervantine Blackness began on a cool summer day on June 19, 2020, historic and symbolic for many reasons, specifically because it commemorates the end of slavery in the United States when a group of protesters exercising their right to unite and speak out against the murder of George Floyd defaced several statues in San Francisco's Golden Gate State Park, including one of Cervantes, and this is specifically um, the image and the defaced statue uh, that, I, that I'm referencing. Um, and I believe that some of you might have read in the pre-circulated English translation of this op-ed piece. My academic co-conspirator Chad Leahy and I also deemed it necessary to intervene collaboratively, collaboratively on the topic. On July 3rd, 2020, we published an op-ed essay in the, in the online Spanish periodical Contexto y Acción titled Cervantes y la Materia de las Vidas Negras. We opine those previous conversations about the incident had failed to mention, let, let alone nuance, Cervantes' subversive critique and pointed questioning of the sub-Saharan African experience in the broader Spanish imperial context. Although rarely spoken of, I urge my audience to recognize that there is no shortage of black people with whom Cervantes contends. In his complete works, the aestheticized cultural linguistic um, blackness of the writer's black subjects do in fact matter, thus forcing us to reconsider in what sense their lives possess an inherent value within the author's literary corpus. But let's not idolize Cervantes too much. 
I view the tagging of the Cervantes statue in San Francisco symbolically on the Juneteenth holiday as an effort to unsettle our personal and societal inheritances of various isms and phobias, colonialism, Eurocentrism, fascism, white supremacist ideologies that potentially have less to do with Cervantes and more to do with all forms of oppressions, these phobias and isms, so on and so forth. Again, that are not um, antithetical to intersecting forms of um, oppression against various groups of people. Echoing Toni Morrison's sentiments in her landmark treatise, Playing in the Dark, Whiteness and the Literary Imagination from 1992, Cervantine blackness operates as a form of literary criticism that extends Morrison's conviction that the white literary canon is always haunted by a black presence. The so-called white literary canon I identify here is that of Cervantes and early modern Spanish literature more broadly. In the age of Cervantes and his contemporaries, and I'm specifically thinking of uh, Luis de Góngora, Lope de Vega, Francisco de Quevedo, Luis Quiñones de Benavente, and Maria de Sayas y Sotomayor, a span of time that covers the reigns of Philip II, Philip III, and Philip IV, black Africans and their descendants, enslaved and free, ate, breathed, created, cried, danced, died, fenced, labored, laughed, lived, just made do, made love, planted, prayed, renounced, revolted, screamed, shouted, starved, studied, suffered, swam, traveled, wrote, and much more across the Iberian uh, again, uh, across the Iberian Peninsula and its colonial outposts and vice royalties. We owe thanks to a wide array of sources, ranging from baptismal records to a slew of demographic sources that aggregate data from census reports that have pinned down African and African diasporic communities. Most recently, for example, newly released works such as Trata Atlantica y Esclavitud in Sevilla, 1500, circa 1500, 1650, and the Iberian world, 1450 to 1820, calculate Seville's enslaved sub-Saharan population to have averaged 11%. Data and numbers aside, my comp contemplation of the cycles of life and death that absorbed, claimed, and consumed both enslaved and free sub-Saharan Africans remains central to any other understanding of Cervantes' literary corpus and should not be permitted to hover at the margins of scholarly literary criticism. And perhaps if we are better to understand the age of Cervantes' Cervantine blackness, then Michel Foucault's philosophical treatise on, the, on l'episteme, the episteme or the way of representation and thinking about the production of, knowledge, of discourse, knowledge, and truth in his order of things from 1966 will thus clarify that my converging of blackness and Cervantes animates new critical possibilities for ways of thinking about the broader implications of one's gaze when receiving Cervantes and his age's depiction of blackness across media and text throughout early modernity. What I have described here categorically, conceptually, and theoretically puts pressure on the study of Cervantes' historical and literary imagination of sub-Saharan African blackness. Organ organized around a multi-point engagement with a concept I term, Cervantine Blackness, the book's methodology is in line with only some of the critical moves I undertook in my first book, Staging Ave de Negros, as well as previously published works. I maintain that Cervantes' black persons and their connections to Africa, Europe, the Americas, and the Ottoman Empire cannot be drawn from a single type of source, for they are both everywhere and nowhere. As mediated by Cervantes' spirit of irony, conveyed in his writings, yet also his pulcritud, or neatly nuanced details, that simultaneously flickers before our eyes, we as readers then come to sense the writer's calibrated critique and reception of the standing of Sub-Saharan African blackness in early modern Spain. So second part on Sancho. So let us get to the root of things. For many centuries now, blackness has been big business, attracting attention and reaping raw profit, not only in the West, but increasingly in the world at large. 
Cervantes and Don Quixote de la Mancha, part one from 1605, part two from 1615, illustrates the material world of sub-Saharan African blackness when Sancho schemes a plan for trafficking black bodies. And so I'll cite the original Castilian and then I'll read Edith Grossman's uh, English translation. And these are Sancho's words here. Y que, que se me da a mí que mis vasallos sean negros. Habrá más que cargar con ellos y traerlos a España. ¿Dónde los podré vender y a dónde me los pagarán de contado? ¿De cuyo dinero podré comprar algún título o algún oficio con que vivir descansado todos los días de mi vida? No, si no dormíos y no tengáis ingenio ni habilidad para disponer de cosas, de las cosas, eh, y para vender 30 o 10 mil vasallos, embájame esas pajas. Par Dios que los te volar con un chico con grande o como pudiera y que por negros que sean, que sean los he de volver blancos o amarillos. Llegaos que me mamo el dedo. What difference does it make to me if my vassals are blacks? All I have to do is put them on a ship and bring them to Spain where I can sell them and I'll be paid for them in cash, and with that money, I'll be able to buy some title or office and live on that for the rest of my life. No flies on me. Who says I don't have the wit or ability to arrange things and sell 30 or 10,000 vassals in the wink of an eye? By God, I'll sell them all, large or small, it's all the same to me. And no, ma and no matter how black they are, I'll turn them white, silver, and yellow, gold. Bring them on then, I am no fool, end quote. Peppered with his rambunctious, rustic dialect, Sancho's fantasy articulated in this passage imbued real life implications for its audience. Employing the technical lexicon of merchants, Sancho utilizes Castilian terms such as comprar, to buy or to purchase, pagar de contado, to cash out, and vender, to sell, to pun on two levels. The first involves the metaphorical alchemical magic of racialized language, transforming black bodies, persons, uh, persons or subjects into silver and gold coins, metals, things, while the second references racial thinking along the lines of colonial metallurgy and pigments or skin color of enslaved persons. In the age of Cervantes, esclavos blancos or white slaves generally consisted of Morisco communities who became abundant following the failure of the Alpujarras Rebellion of 1568 to 1571, whereas Esclavos Loros referred to yellow-hued, darker complexion slaves of any ethnic or racial background. But these so-called puns possess a cultural capital for both Sancho and Cervantes' audience that run much deeper than the author's literary conceits. Sancho's punning signals the profoundly symbolic power that Cervantes invest in what I like to call his material world of blackness. An example of racial thinking, the, this material world of blackness carries an all too familiar autobiographical imprint in Cervantes' cultural imagination and literary journey. As his, as his grandfather owned Esclavos Negros and Esclavos Blancos, and the author himself suffered five years of slavery or captivity in Algiers from 1571 to 1580. The autobiographical imprint I trace here enables me to breathe an actual life into this material's intersectional materiality, thereby showing the importance of recognizing the interplay of the author's familial past and, and his literary corpus. This narrative I seen from Don Quixote, part one, uh, chapter 29, does much more than attend to and poke fun at Don Quixote's chivalric madness and Sancho's gluttonous avarice. Yes, of course, Sancho contemplates the possibility of his slave trading fantasy to crystallize a suspicion upon Don Quixote marrying the Princess Micomicona. But in this episode, S Cervantes also essays the re-narrativization of Sancho's fantasy as imperial governor and negrero, trafficker of black bodies. Daniel Nimser efficaciously reminds us that, and I cite Nimser's language here, far from a theory of government, Sancho's slave trading fantasy articulates an abdication of rule fueled by tangible greed that embodies a model of African slave trading modeled on Portuguese colonialism, end quote. 
the Treaty of Tordesillas from 1494, which gave Spain control of the majority of the American territory, granted Portugal control of Africa in return. Even after the unification of Spain and Portugal in 1580, Portuguese merchants and traders dominated the slave trade and in 1595 received special, specialized asientos or monopolies to carry and trade black Africans in the Iberian Peninsula and the Americas. What is more, the trade in Sub-Saharan Africans increased rapidly after 1580 and most notably peaked around 1614 to 1615, profoundly marking the world in which Cervantes was writing the Quixote. As Alison Bigelow points out in her exemplary new book, Mining Language, Racial Thinking, Indigenous Knowledge, and Colonial Metallurgy in the Early Modern Iberian World, and I reference or cite uh, Bigelow here, materiality has informed literary, philosophical, and art historical studies of metals, labor, race, and empire in the early modern era, end quote. Another way to look at it. This scene codifies the haptic materiality of blackness and, and its sensorial effects of racialized thinking. To grasp this episode's emotive and sensorial possibilities, catalyzed by Sancho's greed and wild imagination, the narrator informs us that, and I quote the Castilian first, con esto, Sancho andaba tan solicito y tan contento que se le olvidaba la pesadumbre de caminar a pie. This made him, in the English translation, this made him so eager and happy that he forgot about his sorrow at having to walk, end quote. In this context, I build on Chi Ming Yang's Marxist approach to the study of silver and other metals in order to illuminate Sancho's fantastical sensory experience. His desire to alchemically alter sovereign black bodies into silver and gold, touching them, seeing them, weighing them, hearing them as if they were converted into aesthetic and affective value. Operative here lies Cervantes' critique of not solely Sancho's self-interested ruminations as slave catcher, but for all who embody this kind of ideology and inhumane work. A discursive critique that resurfaces in the 1613 novela El Coloquio de los Perros, where Cervantes showcases the dog Berganza's anti-black racist ideology and sentiments. What is more, I position Cervantes at the center of 16th and 17th century political thought on sub-Saharan African enslavement, and this scene under and this scene and this underimagined and under theorized scene by Cervantine criticism foregrounds what I like to call a Cervantine blueprint that catalogs the, the complex ways in which the author wrestles with his society's paradoxically complex representation in understanding of sub-Saharan African blackness. Sancho's sensorial affect and desire, euphoric, frenetic, frenzied, conveyed here cannot conceptually, historically, nor ideologically be dislocated from how we codify Cervantes' critique of capitalism qua slave trading as it relates to the institutions of captivity, colonialism, and slavery. A figurative accountant or bookkeeper of some sort, Sancho and Don Quixote, far from cosmopolitan Europeans, concretized Cervantes' literary adaptation of Europeans who believed Sub-Saharan Africans to occupy the same economic and symbolic register as gold and silver did. These Africans become a form of specie, a reliable coin that rendered them into financial instruments. To fully grasp the magnitude of Cervantes' underlying discomfort with and scorn for bondage, captivity, and enslavement, we must not overlook the history of slavery's deep economic and ideological valences. Via his literary characterization of Sancho and his correlation to real history over the course of the 16th and 17th centuries, Cervantes, I argue, simultaneously sheds light on and reckons with the business of slave trading work. Simply, Cervantes builds meaning into the role of capitalism in African slavery. An argument can also be built around Cervantes' own life when we think about the interconnected economies and politics of captivity in Algiers, his rescate, the ransom or rescue, and his bureaucratic document, Información de Argel. In doing so, Don Quixote, part one, chapter 29, demonstrates how Sancho's expressed greed for transforming black, black flesh into gold and silver 
participates in the constellation of early modern ideas related to civility, currency, population, and trade that form the ideological foundation for the logics of race. I concur with historian Jennifer Morgan's infinite insights laid out in, in her book, Reckoning with Slavery, Gender, Kinship, and Capitalism in the Early Black Atlantic, where she prods, and I quote Morgan here, but questions remain as to how slavery might be understood, not just as bound up with the, with the emergence of capitalist economies, but as constitutive of commerce, value, money, and the new cultural logics embedded therein, end quote. Taking cues from Morgan's incomparable analytic, analytical and methodological interventions, yet also keeping in mind the powerful work of scholars such as Herman Bennett, Vincent Brown, Kim Hall, Stephanie Smallwood and her 10 spillers, my take on Sancho's adverse and covetousness throughout parts one and two of the Quixote and its relationship to capitalism and slavery need to be understood as a kind of alchemy. My close reading and earlier references to alchemy gained traction in Morgan's research carried out in Reckoning with Slavery, where she asserts that, and I quote, slave traders had the notion that they could transform human beings into wealth, assigning them a value that rendered them exchangeable and distributable through transport and markets." End quote. Cervantes' Don Quixote represents a textual moment, one of many Iberian foundations, if you will, that provides a win to, window into a set of changes underway in both Iberia and Sub-Saharan Africa. I want my readers to conceive of and to see how Cervantes encodes, Sancho, encodes in Sancho a suggestive signpost of the transformations and how money, wealth, and value were being conceived during the period across vast oceans. The conceptual relationship between gold, silver, and slaves played a crucial role in making entire populations part of a racial valuation that deemed them enslavable. As an ideation of alchemy, Cervantes's construction of Sancho Panza critiques and parodies Europeans who believed that gold, silver, and other minerals were a universally, were, were a universally uh, applicable and legible standard of value. What I find Cervantes probing throughout the infamous chapter 29 of part one of the Quixote um, is how European writers closely connected to the Atlantic, Mediterranean, and Ottoman worlds, like Cervantes himself, produced copious records in the wake of contact with Africans that reflected both mutual confusion and disdain, but also a burgeoning interest in quantification and in understanding pop populations as distinct, quantifiable, and transferable. And so now in this third section, thinking about the state of the field, the state of early, of early modern uh, Spanish literary criticism. Cervantes's uh, critique of Sancho's slave trading antics has haunted me for many years now. The language and experiential modality of haunting, as I recap re recapitulate Avery Gordon's work in Ghostly Matters, describe those singular yet repetitive instances when the blind spot of the under-examined and under-theorized specter of Sub-Saharan African blackness comes into view. These specters or ghosts appear, Gordon, ex Gordon explicates, when the trouble they represent and symptomize is no longer being contained or repressed or blocked from view. Since the first time I had ever encountered Cervantes' black figures, such as the black eunuch Luis and the enslaved black girl Guillomar from El, El Celoso Estremeño, the unnamed black woman housekeeper and her boyfriend in Coloquio de los Perros, and the representation of black Madonnas in the posthumous Byzantine novel, um, Los Trabajos de Persides y Sigismunda from 1617, Cervantes' many references to blackness, aesthetic, cultural, geographic, embodied, linguistic, within and beyond the Quixote, have always compelled me to expose readers within and outside of Spanish literary studies to the authors under imagined and under theorized motley crew of black figures. As Georgino Dopico so eloquently closes her masterful essay, Canons of Fire, Books and Bodies in Don Quixote, Spain, and I quote Dopico here, the scrutiny of the library chapter on Don Quixote brilliantly opens up the door to this or my haunted, enchanted space, 
a place in which reading is both refuge and risk, in which the traces of power and memory are grafted on skin or on paper, in which bodies and books are fraught with history and desire, madness to surrender, madness not to, end quote. I repeat, since the first time I had ever read these lines as an undergraduate in the early 2000s, to having closely examined them with undergraduates and graduate students in the recent years, Cervantes' 1605 reference to black Africans in the Quixote has always compelled me to, under, to analyze these underimagined and under-theorized assortments of black African characters in his complete works. Surprisingly to date, no scholar has examined the salient role of sub-Saharan the salient role Sub-Saharan African blackness has played in the complete works of Cervantes. Yet to the contrary, a, new, a significant number of scholars have given attention to the lives, cultural, literary, historical, and visual of Iberian Muslims, Moriscos, North Africans, and Turks, and the Servantine Corpus. Since the 1980s, European, North American, and South Asian scholars of early modern English studies, most notably experts of Shakespeare, have laid important groundwork for examining the tenability and utility of placing critical race and post-colonial readings of blackness in conversation with early modern English cultural and literary studies. I encourage my fellow early modern Hispanists, Cervantistas in particular, to follow suit. Echoing Margaret Greer's 2011 PMLA publication, Find in Mind the Spanish Golden Age and Early Modern Spanish Studies, Cervantine Blackness aims to, and I quote, uh, Greer's language here, to collaborate across disciplines and national boundaries, end quote. Reflecting on race studies in Shakespeare and the Spanish Inquisition, in light of Cervantine scholarly criticism, William Childers in Transnational Cervantes from 2006 legitimately calls out scholars working on early modern Europe who show disappointingly little interest in the cultural modes arising on the Iberian Peninsula in the late 16th and 17th centuries. Inspired by Childers' compelling insights in his award-winning Transnational Cervantes, I insist that the field of early modern Spanish studies needs to center Sub-Saharan African blackness while examining Cervantes' textual production of it. And to do so isn't a fool's errant nor intellectually bereft, bankrupt of provincial simplicity. What is more, scholarly criticism among certain factions of Cervantine studies and its adjectival, genealogical, and institutional consolidation and footing, and I'm specifically talking about the idea and the notion of an Instituto Cervantes, a Casa Cervantes, and the like, remains to this day extremely traditional and resistant to forward-thinking approaches to the author's body of work. Another way to read the terrain, Cervantes is presently idolized by some Cervantistas on both sides of the Atlantic and arguably worldwide, stands a literary bastion an icon whose image should not be forcibly misread and sullied by such scholarly pursuits with which I wrestle in this book. Cervantine blackness instead braves the scholarly and popular lore that quickly stresses ideological con contortions. My Cervantine blackness intervention dares to address and unpack the efficacy of Cervantes' handling of Sub-Saharan African blackness because the critical analytic of Sub-Saharan African blackness tends to have a penumbral presence in the field due to the fact that Cervantine studies across scholarly generations, geographies, and factions often thinks of blackness as a decorative contribution rather than integral to, let alone a part of, Cervantes' ill that transcends the Quixote. If, as Do Pico suggests, and I quote again Do Pico's language here, Don Quixote playfully and starkly reminds us that behind every book is a body, and with it a madness, real and imagined, a genealogy, authentic and forged, a history remembered and forgotten, end quote. Then how could we not finally, for once, reconfigure blackness in its categorical capaciousness in terms of a book-body relation that calls African and African-descended peoples into being as subjects or objects. But let's not be idle readers here about excavating the untapped reservoir of scholarly possibilities blackness provides in Cervantes' and his contemporaries' writings. Cervantine blackness embraces the important charges put forth by Childers and Greer in its interventions. This book catalogs the complex, yet at times conflicted, 
ways in which Cervantes writes about black Africans, their descendants, and the presence of sub-Saharan African culture in early modern Spain. As such, I assertively reiterate the following. Cervantine blackness does not take interest in reifying calcified narratives that link the so-called representation of both continental Africa and diasporic Africans to and with animals, and I'm talking about canines, felines, and primates. Nor does the book seek to prove Cervantes' black character's agency and humanity, nor does it, in an antithetical antagonism, entertain Afro-pessimistic Afro -pessimistic death dealing. To conclude, Severantine blackness allows me to, re to consider how Cervantes narrated blackness not merely as a racial category of racialized colorism, but more interestingly, in light of the cultural, ideological, linguistic, performative, and textual contours of such a critical fabulation and formation, formulation. Drawing upon my understanding of Cervantine scholarship in my own theorization of blackness in the early modern Iberian world, I suggest we arrange or arrange anew and shift our critiques in and of the author's narrative rendering of blackness. Narrative is always an act of selection, framing, editing, adjusting, and silencing, and Cervantes' writing of blackness, autobiographical, literary, historiographic, or otherwise, is not exempt from this recursive process. Ultimately, Cervantine blackness positions Cervantes as a thinker who channeled the short, both the shortcomings and value of black Africans' aesthetic, cultural, historical, and political maneuverings in the Spain of his time. My thinking encapsulates a cultural, linguistic, and literary double bind that can no longer be ignored by scholars nor nearly dismissed as insignificant or marginal. Thank you. <clears throat> We have about <clears throat> we have about 20 25 minutes for discussion and if you would uh, when you raise your hand let me wait for me to bring you the microphone so we can be sure to record your question and if possible it's always our preference to begin with a student question Some of you know that I'm famous for letting students wait in silence for 10 minutes, <laughs> which we could do this afternoon if we need to. <laughs> ah, <I see. laughs> Um, so I'm curious to know what initially drove you to um, look into this uh, theme of Cervantes. No, right, no, lovely question. So let's see, a lot of it, because I'm also yeah, thinking about what I have in the book, because obviously this is a much shortened, abbreviated version. So definitely going back to this statue here. I, I mean, I would say like the beginning, origins, genesis of this project has a lot to do with California. So in the book, there's a cha I, the chapter one of the book, which is a bit more theoretical, um, answers that your question as in, in terms of thinking about public history, public monuments, statues, and July 3rd, yeah, so July 3rd, 2020, a little while ago. Um, my dear colleague, Chad Leahy, and I, you know, we saw, you know, we heard about this defacing of this, you know, this infamous uh, statue in San Francisco. I didn't want to do it, but he was like, let's write something, let's write something. I was like, Chad, I don't want to do it. But, you know, I conceded and, you know, we wrote, co-authored this piece. And with my spin and contributions, kind of just like stepping back a bit and just 
thinking about, especially in this type of genre of public writing and op-eds and such, thinking about how to simplify and synthesize my own feelings and positions about, in many ways for me, the very willful and deliberate um, rejection of and erasure of um, blackness in Cervantes, that was one, um, you know, origin, impetus, um, inspiration. At the time, I was living in um, California, in Davis, the Davis West Sacramento area, close to the, you know, an hour or so away from the Bay Area. And so when I was really in the thick of writing the book in this first chapter, I was encouraged to, again, step back a bit and explain to my readers California, you know, because this is, you know, something very unique to California, what's going on in, Cal in California, San Francisco. And so for me, that was, again, writing out of my comfort zone, thinking out of my comfort zone. I'm not a historian or scholar of California by any means. So I did some, you know, research and digging and, and reading Joan Didion's work about what was happening, um, you know, Kate Asbury area and, and such. And so that helped me think through and sort of connect in really different ways about, again, public history and monuments. What does it mean? Again, especially, you know, folks that are, you know, your guys' age who are protesting and unhappy with and discontent with perhaps, you know, the state of affairs in this country, even globally, obviously. Um, yeah, so I would say that's a lot of it had to do, has a lot to do with that. Again, stepping out of my comfort zone, really, and thinking about statues and monuments, what does it mean to, for groups of young people especially to come together and protest and to topple over statues and to spray paint them, so on and so forth. So I would say that that's definitely a big, that's one angle and I would say, you know, the more direct, obvious angle is realizing, you know, as I said before, that there's this huge gap in the scholarship um, that the study and the questioning and the serious study of um, racialized blackness, if you will, is glaringly absent in Cervantine studies. When you compare it to when you, you know we think about what's happening in Shakespeare, when we when we think about other authors and writers and such. So. Hi, um, was there a particular reason why you chose the specific work of Don Quixote de la Mancha to emphasize in your book? Is it just because it was one of his most infamous writings or did you find that that was the one work that had most evidence and kind of materials to work through? Sure, no, great question. So with the Sancho, so in the Quixote there, and as I argue in the book, because in the book I have a chapter obviously on Don Quixote, and so what we find in Don Quixote is that blackness, you have to, close reading is very important and essential. And so obviously with the, the scene that I spoke about a lot just now with Sancho in this particular passage, that's more or less many um, readers of the Quixote are aware of that particular, you know, passage. And so in many, you know, in many respects for me, that's it's kind of like a no-brainer to to analyze that. Obviously, the interpretations are very different and what stands out and what resonates to me in this particular scene are other, you know, I'm asking different questions and thinking about, you know, different, different, different things and constructions and representations of, of, of 
enslaved blacks and, and, and such. But in the Quixote itself, and as I argue in the book, you have to, Cervantes isn't, ex in the Quixote particularly, he isn't explicit when and where blackness comes up. A lot of it, you have to know the text well, and you have to know the history, the larger, broader history of what's happening um, during the period. And, and, and as I say, blackness, it, 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 in the Quixote again, in parts one and two, it pops up and flickers all over. So again, yeah, you have to read, and even in my case, the many times that I've read the Quixote and I've taught it, you have to, yeah, read very closely, read the end notes, read different editions of what different philologists and, and, and editors of it have seen and observed. And again, black characters or even thematically blackness, it, as I say, it flickers um, in the text. And so as an example in part two, chapter 25 of, of the Quixote, there's a reference to um, black, black soldiers or formerly enslaved soldiers who you know, have been freed and you know, Don Quixote. And as a subtext, one of the many theme, themes in both parts of the Quixote is the question and the debate between arms and letters. Letras y las armas, what's better? What's more productive? You know, a man who is fighting in war and battle or someone who takes up the, the, the quill and the pen and who participates in these various, you know, literary enterprises and such. Um, and that's a, a debate that appears in both parts of the Quixote. And so in this particular chapter, again, 20, chapter 25, part two of the Quixote, there again, there's always these just really quick drive-by comments or references that Cervantes gives us where um, a lot of times if you're not reading slowly or carefully, you know, they can be looked over and passed by easily. And so you have, you know, stuff like that. Um, in other instances, obviously there's the racial impersonation with Dorotea who, who dresses up. Um, some scholars say that she's in blackface. I don't necessarily buy that, but there is a type of racial impersonation where this woman character by the name of Dorotea racially impersonates and dress up, dresses up as this um, sub-Saharan African queen. Um, and so there are tons, yeah, there are many, many different references um, that just come up and they flicker. It's, it's very ephemeral and, but I, but I would say, you know, as I say in the chapter, in order to draw out and to extrapolate what Cervantes is doing with that, that work is needed, it's required, and, you know, it, you have, one has to be, you know, versed in history, historiography of the time and such. Okay, thank you very much for your talk. I, I, I've read the El Quixote many times, I'm Spanish. And uh, I have never thought about what you, you have said. So it, you know, open, well, something there. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's a very interesting topic. Um, I'm sure you know that in Spain they are trying to prepare new editions of El Quixote, changing things, getting rid of language and things like that. Um, you know, I'm sure that most uh, high school and even college students do not really read El Quixote and do not really understand El Quixote because the language is so, you know, elaborate and things like that. But well, uh, I was thinking, trying to connect or to link uh, your really interesting talk to this, you know, what you have written there, La obra Cervantina nos obliga a reconocer la centralidad de las voces afrodescendientes. So it, it's, it makes it, you know, mandatory, compulsory for us to acknowledge the central character, but in, in, what, what do you mean by this obligation? It's a kind of political obligation, moral obligation, academic obligation, ethical, that's my, my question. Yeah. No, absolutely, no. 
No, good question. I would say that absolutely. It's all, yeah, I would say that it's, you know, all of the above and it, you know, again, it requires us and behooves us to, again, ask certain questions to open our minds to different narratives and paradigms that we've inherited that we're taught and socialized to believe about different groups of, you know, different groups of people. I would say definitely it's, you know, um, you know, whether one takes it seriously or not, I would say that, I mean, most definitely, you know, it's a, it's about time that these types of questions are being asked um, and being tackled, I would say. Because again, for other, you know, non-white, non-European groups, they are in many ways, as the scholarship has shown, shown us, you know, they're given the benefit of the doubt or at least taken seriously in terms of asking certain questions, thinking about um, their particular relationship to or connection with um, such a canonical or iconic um, figure as, you know, as Cervantes. Um, so, I mean, again, I, I would say definitely it's an ethical issue, it's a moral one um, that I think is important to, you know, one that's, that's worth taking up and, 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 and tackling. I'd like to ask if, if I could, uh, I really enjoyed your close reading of that scene with Sancho. Um, might you be able to give another nice example, kind of like that, maybe not from the Quixote. Sure. Yeah, so let's see, I, I know I had referenced in the, from the exemplary novels from 1613, and there's, it's in the colloquy of the dogs, the colloquio de los perros, and in that particular, so where blackness comes up, and again, this question of, of not, not just an issue of, slavery or the, or the enslavement of blacks, but going back to ethics and morals, there's a broader um, moral question that's being, that I would say Cervantes puts out there, puts on the table, you know, for one to, for us as readers to think through, to reckon with. And in short, one of the dogs is clearly very, very racist, xenophobic, and says these very violent and deplorable things about um, the enslaved woman who, black woman who's in the household and the text she's our name, but we're told um, as the dog, as he's, you know, as the conversation is happening with the other dog between Cipion and Berganza, um, you know, the, in short, Berganza is, you know, having a fit over the fact that their master is treating this black woman better than us. And, you know, he, you know, she's given treats and she can run freely in the house, so on and so forth, and she's not put in her place, she's not put in check. And Berganza goes at lengths to say that if I were the master, I, and he uses very, you know, vulgar, you know, he calls her the B word and all this stuff. And he was like, if it were me, I'd put her on a rack and break her back like the Portuguese did their slaves. And so this very, you know, this, you know, you're throwing it back. You're like, well, okay, that's, you know, a lot. And so there are moments like that where, you know, in short, thinking about ethics and morals and in these exemplary novels, there's always this question of, you know, of, 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 of the more, you know, of more, you know, what's the moral of the story, the takeaway, so on and so forth. And so that, I would say that that's one, that's a lot to chew on, to think about, again, what could Cervantes mean about this? What, what is he implying? What is he critiquing, taking issue with? Um, who's more of the animal? And again, that's a very, you know, baseline interpretation, but there are other, you know, ways to chip away at, what, at that particular dynamic that, uh, you know, what's going on, 
in the book, I have another chapter that's focused on um, a black eunuch by the name of, Lu of Luis and El Celoso Estremeño. And in the scholarship, has mainly read that short story in the context of the new world and looking to the, yeah, looking to the Americas. And for me, while I acknowledge that type of reading, I'm more interested in framing El Celoso Estremeño in, in Luis, again, this black eunuch, his maneuverings and his machinations in this particular household, looking to the Ottoman Empire, the Ottoman world and harems and thinking about Islam and such. So yeah, those are, you know, for me at least two um, examples that stand out. Also in the book, even though it's not about Cervantes, but I have a chapter on Maria de Sayas, who serves as a fool when you're talking about the exemplary novel. She, I mean, it, she's a foil. Sayas and Cervantes work as a foil to one another in that in that particular corpus of the novella, the short stories, um, which can be traced back to Boccaccio and so on and so frame tells and things. And so in Sayas, there are two um, black characters who stand out. And for me, my interest in this particular chapter is about interracial intimacy. Um, because again, in the scholarly interpretation, it's always about how racist Sias is. And it's like, okay, yeah, duh, that's a no brainer. And so for me, I'm more interested in thinking about how Sias pairs and represents these white, black, these black and white um, relations and this intimacy and such, which she, parts, I argue, in very dangerous ways from what Cervantes does in his um, representations and treatments of um, slavery and the black characters that pop up and come up in his, in his works. Um, is it fair to say that, and this is a second example from Cervantes, but similar a little bit to the Sancho, that, that um, Cervantes uses characters who are partly comic, partly lower status to critique, to to investigate for the purposes of an ironic distance or critique? Sure, I perhaps? mean, I would say that, I mean, I would say that it's all of the above in many ways, because again, with the case of Luis, he has, he's essential, even though there's scholars who would say otherwise, um, you know, Alban Por Porcione, Porcione being one of them, um, in his very established, you know, books on 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 El Celoso Estremeño. But for me, Luis, this black eunuch, is integral and central to the evolution and the plot of what happens um, in this short story. Um, and so, and he also, uh, and with status and roles, I would say, I, 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 I suggest and, and, and stand by the fact that in El Celoso Estremeño, Luis is essential. He's a main figure in, in you know, in the text. In the, in, in the, there, in Cervantes extrapolates and shows us and gives us in a diasporic sense how Luis's blackness um, unfolds what it means, whether it has to do with music and the text, again, reading the text carefully, Luis's language, or his voice is um, described as atiplado. And so atiplado is this high pitch. It's a voice that's high pitched and can go in the higher treble ranges, but the text also tells us that Luis's voice can also go down to the lower bass baritone registers. And so in that chapter, you know, I'm, I look at and turn to sound studies and do musicological readings and thinking about the castrati from Italy and, and opera um, music in Cervantes, which was so important particularly not just in El Celoso Tremeño, but in 
all of Cervantes' works where you, music is always there, musicality. Um, Luisa is also connected to, um, or perhaps racialized for his love or proclivity for music and playing the guitar. And so for me, as opposed to going the easy route of saying, oh, this is a racist stereotype, I really pick apart and trace the evolution and the musical history, the instrument history, if you will, of black guitar players in placing Luis in that broader 15th or 16th, 17th century transatlantic, but also Mediterranean world of black guitar players. And so those are the types of inter analyses and questions, yeah, that I, that really motivate and propel the way that I'm yeah, thinking about, yeah, these. I think we have time probably for one more question. And before getting to that, let me remind you that we have a reception just down the hallway in the great room. Please come and join us uh, after we conclude. Hi, thanks for the talk, Patrick Breen. Um, not often um, do I go to talks like this and see one word used as much and as heavily as serpentine. And I'm feeling like I'm certainly, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not clear. I want you to explain what you mean by that, explain its roots. I don't, there's, so, there's more there than I'm getting. Sure, sure. And so I want to yeah. hear about that. Sure, sure, no. Um, I mean, I, I would say for myself, for Servantine, with this book, I wanted a short, I mean, in a pragmatic sense, I wanted a title for this book that was short and punchy. I didn't want subtitles and so on and so forth. And with that short and punchiness, as I talk, as I say very quickly, as I said very quickly in the talk, it's implicating and talking about the adjectival and the genealogical meanings and, and symbolisms of Cervantes. So obviously Cervantes as perhaps, you know, as this proper noun, this person, but Cervantine or Cervantine, however you wish to pronounce it, is talking about the descriptor of it, is talking about the institutions behind this icon, I would say, for me. Thank you all so much for being with us this afternoon. Please do come down and join us in the great room, and please also join me in thanking our guests. Thank you.